Who did he do this for? He did it for me. See, it's got to become yours if you want to enjoy it. Yes, he did it for the world, but you must see it as having been done for you. It's important. Very, very important. And so I just wanted to remind you all of something that the Holy Spirit spoke to my spirit uh, while I was getting ready to come last week. And it was this. Every victory Jesus Christ won belongs to the church, his body. So if you're born again, that's you, isn't it? Everything he, every victory he won belongs to you. See, you must see yourself like this. You must believe these truths. And then you must live them out, walk them out. Take hold of them. Claim them. You know, you have to claim your inheritance. Yes, you have to claim your inheritance. Whether it's a spiritual inheritance or a natural inheritance. If you want to enjoy it, you must Claim your inheritance. And so I want you to put up for us here real quickly Colossians 1 and 12. And see what this tells us. This is written to the church. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet or able to be what? Partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So everything Jesus won in his victory over Satan, over death, over hell, belongs to the body of Christ. He did it for the world, remember. But once you took him as Savior, you became a legal heir of everything he did, everything. So start seeing yourself from that position and start claiming your inheritance. An inheritance that's not claimed won't benefit you, will it? No, it won't. And so today, uh, from there, I wanted you to go the, to this uh, Go to Isaiah 53 and 1, and I wanted to ask you a question. This is, this is a question to you from God. What does it say? Who hath believed our report? See, if we need so much, if we want to live it out and claim our inheritance, we've got to believe God's report. This is God's report. This is the word of God. This is written to the church. All of the, the new covenant is written to you. And you're an heir of everything Christ did. But now here, Isaiah is seeing in a vision form, he saw Calvary. And he is foretelling what the Christ would do when he came to go to the cross for you. You've got to see this as yours. He went to the cross for you. He did. He did it for the world. Remember, we looked at this one many times, Isaiah 49 and 6. He came to be salvation to the end of the earth. And then Isaiah 51 and 8, from generation to generation. That covers every generation. But now God says, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? So if you want the power of God manifested on your behalf, you nemo say, you must believe his report. That's your part. He fulfilled Isaiah 53. He went to the cross, gave himself a ransom for us, we're told, redeemed us from the curse, took the curse for us. 
We're told these were truths in the word of God. But here God says, who have believed our report? And then at when, when the Lord brought this to my remembrance this morning, um, it's either bef just before I got up or not after that about, and he reminded me of after I had begun to claim my healing back there when I was semi-invalid and I was studying my scriptures every morning. That's the first thing I do uh, after I'd have some little something to eat. Uh, then I would go through all the healing scriptures and I was claiming my healing. And so if you remember, I've told you many times, I suppose, but I, when I got to Mark, the fifth chapter there, and I was reading about the little woman with the issue of blood that had been sick 12 years, spent all the money she had with the physicians trying to get well, had gotten no better, but only had gotten worse. And so when I got down to that, and I got to verse 34, where the Lord said to her, so put up uh, Mark 5 and 34. When I got down there and I read that part, and he said unto her, daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me, said, it's time for you to start acting on what you believe. See, if you believe it, then you're going to act like you believe it, right? You got to put some action up. You remember James put it this way, faith without corresponding action is dead faith. So you got to get your, especially your mouth to working. You got to start speaking the word of God, confessing. Remember, it's confessing unto concerning all that salvation is. Romans 10 and 10, it's believing in your spirit and then you confessing unto. See, that's where we've missed it so many times. I was waiting. I wanted the symptoms to go. And here I was, I was claiming these, all the scriptures and I was going to actually fully believe that I was when the symptoms were gone. But it doesn't work that way. Just like you had to take him as savior when you were a sinner, you got to take him as healer while you're sick. Healing belongs to you. It is your inheritance. But this, the Lord wanted to know who hath believed our report. And then, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? It's to the one that believes his report. So first we must believe his report, right? Whose part is it to believe? He's the performer. And now he's already performed. Is Calvary a finished work? Did Jesus go to the cross? Did he give himself a ransom for you and me? Did he take our sins? Did he take our sickness and disease? Did he defeat Satan and all the demons? Colossians 2 and 15, spoil principalities and powers, made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in doing it. He did it. He defeated Satan. Now Satan, he doesn't like for people to learn that truth. And then to learn that you have authority in the name of Jesus to submit to God and resist him, oppose him, withstand him, and put him to flight. But again, that's your part. James 4 and 7. How many of you have ever read James 4 and 7? Put up James 4 and 7. See, this is written to you also. And no one can do this for you but you. 
So is it important to learn these truths? He said, submit yourself, therefore, to God. And then what should you do? That means oppose, withstand, act against, keep from. And Brother Hagin brought out in there, fight back. It means to fight back. You can't just sit down and take it. If you sit down and take it and claim it, you know what? You're going to walk in it. So these, these truths are so important. These are the words of God, creator of heaven and earth, the one that so loved the world and put yourself in there, so loved you. He so loved me that he gave his only begotten son that if I would believe in him, I would not perish, but I would have eternal life. See, you got to believe that yourself. And then believe that Jesus so loved you that he did John 3 and 17. He said, the Father didn't send me. Put up, yeah. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. We lay under condemnation. Father didn't send him to condemn the world, but why did he send him? That the world, everyone to the ends of the earth, could be saved through the work he would do on the cross. See? So whose hands is it in now? I've heard people say it. It's all in God's hands. Oh, no, it isn't. It's in your hands now. It passed from his hands to yours after he took those nails in his hands and that spear in his side. Those stripes, they plowed long their furrows on my back, he said. After he finished that work, it was no longer in his hands. It's in yours. Hold out your hands. Say, it's in my hands now. Hands. What I do about what he did. Amen. It's true. See, a lot of people are still waiting on God. They're waiting on God. I've been there. You know how I know so much of this? I've walked it. I had to learn these truths to come out of that place. I reached a place that I would rather have died as to have lived in the condition I was in because I, I knew I was going to heaven if I died. In fact, at one time I tried to die, tried to quit breathing. You can't do that. You can hold your breath a long time, but you can't hold it. You can't, eventually you're going to take it again. But oh, the work of Jesus. And for God so, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Verse 16 tells us that whoever believes in him that's why Miss Doris made us up a, a list of some of these words that we can have a full meaning of the, uh, an understanding, full understanding of their meaning. Believe does not mean mentally agree or mentally assent to, mental acceptance. And we've, we, we've kind of gone on that sometimes saying, well, I believe, but now the Lord wants to know who believes his report. See, if what you believe, you trust in. Amen. You rely on it. You commit to it. 
So that word believe. Trust in. Rely upon. Commit to. Cling to. Adhere to. So do you believe his report? You believe by his stripes you were healed? Well then now it's time to act like it. See, faith is an act. It's like he told me, it's time for you to start acting on what you believe. And at that time my left hip was locked in position. I couldn't turn my neck. My other joints were locking up. I limped very badly when I walked. And here I was going through claiming all the scriptures. But there came a time I had to start acting on what I believed. And so I've shared with you what I did. I asked my sister, Elizabeth, who had resigned her position and we had paid her what she had been making on her job for her to come and help me and look out for me. She helped me get a bath. She cooked, did all of the cooking for my husband and my son and myself and took care of my house and we paid her. And so I asked her, Elizabeth, would you go with me today to see Sister Stansky? I, I had thought, well, what could I do to act on what I believe? So I asked her, Elizabeth, would you go with me? Because see, I still could not turn my neck, my head to see. And I was, I lived right here by a four lane drive and I was gonna have to pull out and turn that way so when I asked her, she said, no, you just wait till you're feeling better. But I knew what the Lord had said. So Elizabeth said, no. So that left me one thing. I had to get in the car, act on the word. So I claimed Psalms 91 to 11. And it had been about three years since I'd driven I pulled out there to the drive, to the four lane, claimed Psalms 91 to 11, used my peripheral vision as much as I could, headed that way. And then after that, not on Sunday, but the other days, I'd get in my car, and at that time we lived close to uh, the Kmart that was up on North Parkway. I'd get in my car and go up there and walk around in the store there with my knees hurting and the enemy telling me, you're gonna fall right here on the floor. I said, oh no, I won't. And I'd quote him Isaiah 41 and 10. How many of you know what Isaiah 41 and 10 says? He said, fear thou not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you, and I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. And he did. I never did fall. But you know what? After the Lord told me it's time for you to act, my symptoms and all just sailed away. They were still there. But see, I'd been studying. I'd been meditating on the Word. I'd been even actually confessing the Word. So, but now it was time to act on the Word. And if you've ever had any long battles, I'm sure you've learned these truths already. But you know what? Just because they work one time, next time you come under attack, you got to do the same thing. I've had many attacks. 
In fact, I'll just go ahead and tell you now, which I didn't tell for a long time, but it's coming up on 11 years ago now, in 2013, July 27th, I had gone to, I didn't have a doctor now at that time, I went to my husband's doctor, and uh, she called while I was at healing school that morning. On Tuesday, I'd gone there on Monday, and she called Eddie, and she said, y'all need to get Opal to the hospital as soon as you can. Said her blood is dangerously low. It was 5.599, that's low. And so I went, and she said, and she got one of the main doctors that was, I think, partial owner in Crestwood, but he, he, she said, he's going to have everything set up for her. Said, all she'll have to do is just go and check in. So they came, got me. We went to the hospital. And uh, they suspected something. And so they, had to, they did a colonoscopy. And they came back with a report that I had a malignant tumor. And uh, so they did surgery. And uh, the oncologist, they started talking chemo. And I asked them, I said, well, now, if I were to take chemo, in your estimation, what percentage uh, chance of recovery would you give me? They said, 30%. I said, I'll just go with a sure thing. And I'd already shared with them how the Lord had raised me up when I had the bone and muscle conditions, been semi-invalid. And so you know what? I went with a sure thing. Amen. And here I am. Amen. That was 2013. And not many people here at the church knew about it because I told Pastor Mark, I said, don't put me on the prayer list. I don't want any visitors. I let Pastor Mark I let Norris and, and Pastor Belinda and Pastor Rhonda. And at that time, uh, Jim and Wanda were here. I let them come. But I told them up there also at the hospital, I said, I want no calls and no visitors. Because at that time I was doing TV, knew a lot of people, and I didn't want calls and I didn't want visits. And so I knew I knew God's word is sure. Did I have to fight? Yes. At that time Sherry was, was coming all the time and she would take me. Sometimes we'd go over to Cracker Barrel to eat. Sometimes I'd have to, beside the car, I'd have to vomit or different things. So there, I had symptoms to deal with, but I also knew God's word is sure. His word is sure. But I didn't get there overnight to where I knew it was sure. And you won't either. That's why Nisoma, you must get in the Word. You must get the Word of God in you. You must start believing it. You must start believing His report. You need to start meditating on His Word. If you want to live it out. How many of you want to live out the victories Jesus gained? We're meant to, aren't we? Made an heir. And so different ones at the church would tell me, well, we've been praying for you, but we didn't know what was wrong. They thought I was going to tell them, but I never did tell them. You know, I, why I, mainly that I didn't tell, I didn't want anybody else, if they came under attack,
to say, well, this is what Oprah done and this is what I'll do because if you don't have your faith built to do that, you better not do it. You better go with what they can do for you. But I knew, I knew healing belonged to me. I knew that. I knew that was a sure thing. And as I said, here I am. And I will be 88 next month. So I think that's pretty long life. How about you? And I just, I've told the Lord all the time, ever since he called me, Lord, I want to finish my course. I want to do everything you've called me to do. And if it was left up to me, after I finish what you've called me to do, I'd like to come home the next day. Heaven's real. And the Apostle Paul, while he was not sick, said, and there in Philippians, the first chapter, he said, I'm in a desire, a strait between two desires. Let's see. Let me let, get that put up on the board. It's Philippians 1 and, let me see. Philippians. Philippians 1. Well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm remembering the long, wrong. I sure thought it was Philippians 1. Anyway, he said, I'm in a strait betwixt two desires he's talking about. 123, 123 thank you, Doris. Philippians 123. I didn't look down far enough. That's it. Yeah. Well, it starts before that. He said in verse 21, for, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Said it'd be his gain. And he wasn't sick when he's saying these things. Yes, he was being persecuted beyond measure beyond anything we could ever think of. You just read about Paul. I mean, a after he turned from fighting the Christians, those that he had run with, they turned on him, and 40 of them once at one time made an oath that they were not going to eat until they'd killed him. So he was persecuted night and day. <coughs> And so he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then he comes on down and says in verse 23, for I am in a strait betwixt two, I mean two desires, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. If, you, if you're a Christian, you know you don't have to fear death. We're not supposed to fear death. For I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But then he goes on and said, 24, nevertheless to abide in the flesh, for me to stay here in my body is more needful for you. Why? that he might teach others also. Next verse, one, one more verse. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. So that was the Apostle Paul's viewpoint and attitude. He said he, 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 he desired to be with the Lord. He said, which is far better. It's going to be far better. I mean, we've, I've had some wonderful times in the Lord down here. 
But when you get there in his presence, forever to be with him, I've heard of people that have died and gone and the Lord wouldn't let them stay and they didn't want to come back. Heaven's a wonderful place. Now, we're not told a whole lot about it in the Word of God, but oh, it's real. So, can you see that dying's not a big deal? If you're a Christian, you don't have to fear death. All you have to do is just love the Lord and stay ready. So, anyway, but that word believe, the Lord said, who had believed our report? where he comes on down and tells us that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Well, now, if you want to walk in health and you want to be healed, you're going to have to believe that. You've got to believe it. Yeah, I believe it. I had to develop a confidence in his word. I had to come to that place. I believed it. Not just mentally agreeing, thy word's all true, all your word's true. But then I had to come to that place that, as he told me, it's time for you to start acting on what you believe. Because real faith does have corresponding action. So you just figure out what action it is the Lord wants you to take. I was, one of my actions was to start walking. With the pain there. And the enemy tell me, you're going to fall on the floor. And I'd tell him, oh, no, I'm not. And, and I said, quote him, Isaiah 41 and 10. Never did fall. And so that word believe, trust in rely upon, commit to, cling to, and adhere to, and you don't start there. You develop a confidence by study and by meditating on the Word of God. That's why I'm telling you, get in the book and get the book in you. Get in the Word and get the Word in you. You remember here, a few uh, weeks ago, I read to you about nine different things that the Lord had, had uh, given me there. And one of them was, you don't love God any more than you love his word. A lot of people didn't, had never had thought about that, but it's true. You don't love God any more than you love his word. Remember who the word is? You remember John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, and then verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him. This is John 1 and 1. We started out with John 1, 1. All things were made by Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the word was made flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Even the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. And then over there in John 14 and 9. He said. When you've seen me. You've seen the Father. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me has seen the Father. He will, and then over in Hebrews 1 and 3, so go ahead and put that one up now, says he's the express image of the Father who being the brightness of his glory 
and the ex express image of his person. This is Jesus talking about God. If, you, you, if we'd have started with verse 2, you would have seen. And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He said he's the express image of the Father. So when, when, when the Holy Spirit gave me those things about the word, and I began to tell the people, you don't love God any more than you love his word. And another one was you don't believe God any more than you believe his word. It's true, isn't it? See, remember who the word is. Son of God made flesh. And so he also, a year ago at least, started telling me to tell you his body. Feed on his word. Feed on his word. That's your faith food. That's your only faith food. That's your only spirit food. And you are a spirit being. You have a soul and you live in a body. And Jesus said in Matthew 4 and 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But how many Christians are trying to live on earthly food alone? And they don't get in the word, don't know the word, don't confess the word, just mentally agree that it's true, don't really believe that it's true, don't trust in it, don't rely upon it. See, if you don't trust in it, rely on it, and commit to it, you don't really believe it, do you? Hmm? See? Just mental assent won't work. I've been there. Didn't work for me. Had to get in the Word. Had to start taking God at His Word. This is the one thing that God watches over to perform. And this is the one thing that will feed your spirit. And this is the one thing that the enemy is going to try to keep you away from it. He doesn't want you studying the Word. He doesn't want you getting full of the Word and getting that Word off the pages in your heart and in your mouth. The Word's powerful coming out of your mouth. The Word of God is. The Word of God is powerful. It's powerful coming out of your mouth. The Word is. We need to trust in that power. By the word of the Lord of the heavens made. Psalms 33 and 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. And all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. How powerful is the word? And then we just got through reading there in Hebrews 1 and 3. He upholds all things by his word. How powerful is his word? That's why the enemy wants you to ignore the word. And so remember, I, how many of you was here when I asked you, how many of you fed your bodies today? Everybody raised their hands. And then I said, how many of you fed your spirit? Everybody couldn't raise their hand. More important if you're going to let one of them go a day or two or three. Let the feed the body go. Feed on the word. It's your faith food. It's your spirit food. It'll build you up and give you your inheritance, it says. said the word of God will build you up. And you are a spirit being. Have a soul, mind, will, and emotions. Live in a body. So let's get serious about the word. How many of you want to walk in the word? 
How many of you want the word to hold you up? How many of you want it performed in your life? Yeah. So, I, I'm going to bring those nine again sometime pretty soon and read them again. So believe, trust in, rely on, and commit to. And so today, um, I wanted to talk to you about the spirit of faith. And I don't have long to do it here. But the spirit of faith. The Bible said we have the spirit of faith. So put up 2 Corinthians 4 and 13. The spirit of faith. You need, you need the spirit of faith. First, 2 Corinthians 4 and 13. We, having the same spirit of faith. Now this is the Apostle Paul telling us. We, having the same spirit of faith, as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Did you know you're supposed to do that? You're supposed to believe the word and speak the word. In fact, we are told in, in Romans 10 and 10, that's how you enter into. It's by believing the word and confessing unto. How many of you remember we look at that one every now and then? That's how you enter into this great provisions that God has made. By believing in your heart and confessing unto and, and that word unto, you can find that on there also. It's to or into, indicating the point reached or entered of desired purpose or plan. That's why I, I looked up these words out of the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. You need to know what these little words mean sometime so you can live them out. You can do them. So... Uh, Romans 10 and 10, we'll look at probably our last one today, but the spirit of faith, the spirit of faith believes God and calls those things that be not as though they were. And it becomes. And I put down there, Abraham did this. And we looked at Abraham and uh, Abraham in Romans 4 and 3, but while he's there, see what, what, does, what does Romans 10 and 10 tell you? And when, he, when he's talking about the heart, he's talking about the spirit of you, your spirit being, the core of your being, the spirit of your, the inward man, the hidden man of the heart. Peter calls it the hidden man of the heart. For with the heart man believes unto, to or into, Righteousness and with the what? You gonna have to get that mouth to working, girl, boys, men, women, and you're gonna have to get it to saying the right words, confessing unto what it is that God has promised and provided. That becomes important. Confessing unto, isn't that right, Sherry? Sherry, she fought for Stan when he couldn't fight for himself. He started saying things he shouldn't say. She'd tell him, oh, no. We're not saying that. Ben, he was talking right, believing right. Got a quick recovery. Still progressing. It matters what you're saying, doesn't it, Ben? What you believe in. Amen. And so with the heart, the spirit, man believes, trusts in, relies on. So you got to come to that believing before you can trust in it. Because trust is a part of believing. Trusting in. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth. Oh, it's so important how you use your mouth. And again, this is kind of 
comical, but yet in a way it wasn't funny. But Miss Doris and I, you know, we, we've been scra Scrabble buddies for years now. In fact, when I was in the hospital up there in 2013, she brought a Scrabble set as a gift. And so I was talking to her on the phone and uh, we were gonna be playing that night. I said, we, and then we played three games. And I said, you may win all three games. She said, that's right. <laughs> and when I finished, I thought, now why did I say that? <laughs> she won all three that night. And on uh, the last one, I should have won it. I just made a mistake. Boy, the letters you draw really mean a lot. But, but see, I had learned, watch your words. And when I said that, I thought, uh, uh, why, why did I say that? And she won all three. Don't say what you don't want. So with the heart, man believeth. And a lot of people do foolish talking. And they say, well, I didn't really mean it. Well, then why did you say it? The enemy wants your tongue. He wants your words. If you can't say what agrees with the word, do like Proverbs, I believe it's 32, and uh, I forget the exact location now, but it says, if you've done foolishly in lifting up yourself, lay your hand up on your mouth. mouth. Proverbs 32 and something there. Maybe 31, 32, 31, seems like. But it, right now, I've memorized so many scriptures. So with the heart, man believeth, your spirit, unto righteousness, and with the mouth. Both are important. The body of Christ, most of the body of Christ does not realize the importance of confession. What you're saying. Confession unto salvation. And what, what does salvation mean? Have, I believe we've got that on there even. But anyway, it's rescue, safety, deliverance, healing, health, save, and saving. That's what salvation, your salvation. Jesus came to be salvation to the ends of the earth. He's all of these things. Soteria, rescue. Where did he rescue, rescue you from? The kingdom of darkness, Colossians 1 and 13. Delivered you from the kingdom of darkness, Satan's kingdom, power, control, and dominion. And we are told as children of God over in Psalms 107 and verse 2, but I don't hear a lot of people saying it. He said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. That's what I did all through COVID. How are you doing? I'm blessed and redeemed. I didn't trust in a mask. Masks, those masks don't keep anybody safe. But the word will. And he said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. We're redeemed by the blood of the lamb, we're told. How many of you know you've been redeemed? Amen. From the curse. Yes. By the blood of the Lamb. Yes. What was the cost of your redemption? Oh, I'm telling you, costly. Your salvation was costly. But Jesus was willing to pay the price. He was willing to take your place and my place. Salvation. 
And so, but we are told that we're to know the truth. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you'll know the truth. Do you know you don't walk in the truth you don't know? That's what the third chapter in the book of mine, it's we only walk in those truths we know and apply. And that's taken most of it from Colossians 1, 9 through 14, which I've advised everybody to memorize, but not too many people have done it. I memorized those words. Why? It's telling you how to walk in victory right there. Colossians 1, 9 through 14, it lets us know he wants us to know the wisdom of God. He wants us to know it, and then he wants us to walk in it. And he wants us to know we've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness, Satan's kingdom, power, control, and dominion, that we've been placed into the kingdom of God's dear son, and that we have redemption, Colossians 1 and 14, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Ransom in full, riddance, all that Christ's salvation is. That's what redemption is. Ransom in full. Specifically, Christ's salvation. Everything that salvation is belongs to us. But back to this. Let me get back to this real quickly. Having the spirit of faith. And so Abraham did this. We're told in Romans 4 and 3. So we'll just have to, I'll have to get, do that. and We'll go down through here to put up Romans 4 and 3. For what saith the scripture? Did you know what the scripture said is the truth? And that you need to know the scripture. You're, you're told study to show yourself to prove unto God. Abraham believed God. That's what we have to do, believe God. If he hadn't believed God, he would have never become what God told him he'd be. So Abraham believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. And now go to 17. And we're going to look through 17 through 25. And I think that's as far as we're going to get today. But, oh, you need the spirit of faith. The Bible said you have it. But you know you have to use it. So what did he do? He believed God. And Abraham began to call himself what God called him. Spirit of faith does this. Calls yourself what God calls you. If you're believing that you are what God calls you, you'll call yourself what God calls you, won't you? Even if you want to become what God calls you, you better do it. This was before he became the father of nations. This is how he obtained the promise. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, that's God's part, but, and calleth those things. Well, this God was, when God told him, you're no longer Abram, but Abraham, God was calling those things that be not as though they were. But Abraham began to call himself what God called him. Calleth those things that be not as though they were. Verse 18. Who against hope. He had no natural hope. No reason to hope in the natural. Any, anybody else been there besides me? Where you had no reason to hope in the natural? Well, you better get your hope then. And the way, way you'll get your hope is... Same way you get your faith from the Word of God. Romans 15 and 4 says that's how we get our hope from those things that are written, which would be the Word of God. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, which God had spoken to him, so shall thy seed be. Verse 19. And being not weak in faith, see, weak faith won't do that. 
Weak faith won't call themselves what God calls them when it doesn't look like it yet. See, many Christians are walking by sight, not by faith. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 tells us this. We walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. He was not walking by sight. He was walking by faith. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead for all practical purposes of bearing children when he was about 100 years old and neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God, wavered not back and forth through unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, praising God. Being strong in faith, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, fully convinced that what God had promised him, he was able to perform it. Verse 22. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. His belief in God was imputed to him as righteousness. But then now this. 23, I saw that 23 and 25 is written to the church. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, Abram's, Abraham's, that it was imputed to him. All right, next, but for us also, 20, verse 24. But for us also. This was written for us also, it said. This was written for you also to whom it shall be imputed if, so the rest of it's contingent upon that, what we do now, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. That's talking about Calvary, isn't it? If we believe on him, that was delivered up for us to the cross and was raised again to justify us. That's where our faith has to be, isn't it? In Jesus, in the Word of God. See, if your faith's not in the Word of God, it's not Bible faith and it's not receiving faith. So, and the spirit of faith, Abraham called himself, called those things that be not as though they were. And then I had some others here. I said, David did this. We were going to look at some of that. Joshua and Caleb did this. And I said, Christian, the Christian church is still to do this. 2 Corinthians 4 and 13, we saw that. And so, we're supposed to do that. Let me, and I'm going to read you this right here and, and we're going. I said, the basics of faith is believing God's word when you can't see it or feel it. Faith also calls those things that be not as though they were. The prophets did this. God did this, Isaiah 46 and 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times Put up Isaiah 46 and 10. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times those things that are not yet done. Saying my counsel will stand and I will do all of my good pleasure. And then in verse 10, 13, he tells us about how salvation is coming. His salvation is coming. So God did this. And I said Jesus told us to do this. In Mark 11, 22 through 26, he tells us to believe and talk to the mountain. And then Paul said the spirit of faith does this, which we looked at. He also tells us where faith looks, 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, and Hebrews 12 and 2 are faith's focus. And so 
I can see I'm going to have to talk on this some more next week. But I said, your spirit can take hold of God's word while it is unseen. And the title of today's message uh, today, uh, Sherry, is You Must Believe God's Report. Faith is believing God's report. Amen. God bless you. Such good and perfect gifts Yet sometimes I push them away Simply because I just didn't believe All your word has to say Lord, I thank you for your mercy You're so long-suffering to me But I'm ready to walk in the power of your resurrection I am ready to stand in your place of victory. I believe in the finished work of Jesus. I believe in the finished work of the cross. Spirit, soul, and body, you restored what had been lost. I believe. Work of the cross. You've given such good and perfect gifts, and now I no longer push them away. Despite all that I see, my heart will believe all your word has to say. Lord, I thank you for your healing. You endured such punishment for me. So I'm taking my stand in the power of your resurrection. Yes, I am taking my stand in your place of victory. Cause I believe in the finished work of Jesus. I believe in the finished work of the cross. the cross.